All right. So last week we had a great show with Tim Stallings, your partner there. Both started this business as estate planning attorneys. And this story kind of goes along with that whole idea of getting your legal papers in line. A survey from Vanguard found that 84 percent of people struggled when they should turn their assets over to their kids or their other trustees. So, I mean, I, I love the fact that I've had experience with this. My mom, as I've mentioned, is in memory care. A couple of years ago, she put together a will. She made me the financial power of attorney. She made me executor of the will. She had me sign that so I knew exactly what her wishes were. But then there came that point where as her mental faculties declined, at what point should I take over these responsibilities? And that was kind of hard. That conversation never really took place. Greg, how does that unfold as you talk to people? That's a great question. And it's a question we get, obviously, over the course of our practice, you know, at Ehler Stallings, you know, you know, we had to guide people to help them understand how the documents work. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, whether it be a trustee stepping in, a healthcare power attorney or a finance power attorney. And I always want to be clear. Those are the three living documents, meaning you are still alive when those are activated. Well, people say, what about the executor? You're dead. You mm -hmm. know, when, 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 when a will is effectuated and executor steps in, the only time that will ever happen is after you pass away. So the living documents, again, are the healthcare power attorney, the finance power attorney, and a trustee. And the way that these typically work now, on rare occasion, we will have joint where sometimes a mom... Um, or a dad will say, you know what? I just want the kid to have access now. Now that's very atypical. Most uh, parents are very proud. They don't want their kids having access to their accounts. But if, in the case, you can always make it now. And, mm -hmm. and they can be joint trustees or they can have financial power attorney now or healthcare power attorney now. But the majority, the lion's share, over 95% of the plans that we built uh, for thousands of Ohioans over the last decade have what they call a spring. And in Ohio, it's called a springing uh, power. And that springing power jumps when basically a doctor or two doctors can confirm that they don't have their faculties. Okay. So they can't make decisions on behalf of themselves. And a lot of times you have to get a, a, a letter from a doctor uh, to step in and, and, and bring that document to life. And um, a lot of times it's a tough call to make as a kid, yeah. right? You don't want to, you don't want to do it. But at the end of the day, I always want to make sure I empower all of those, you know, kids out there uh, who are in that position is that's why they named you. Yeah. They did this for this exact scenario. And if you sit there and hesitate or you sit there and say, well, you know, I don't know. Then, you know, we tell mom and dad who's going to step up when they need to step up. And we're naming these people. We want the assertive child. We want the decision making mm -hmm. child. Because the worst thing that can happen is nothing. Or and there's then, disagreement no, among yeah. the siblings. Yeah, that's bad too. Who can stand up? And then we just have the other, the other ones don't have any rights. So that's what we say. We understand this is what your, your siblings say, but they aren't named. Mm -hmm. You are. Mm -hmm. So that's an empowering, empowering thing. Now, some people do it by committee, and that's great, right? Like if you think that'll work, that's fine. But at the end of the day, you know, when you, know, you think that mom and dad are having faculty issues, meaning that you're considering home care assisted living, nursing home, that's when you need to start looking into, maybe I should start taking over the books because they're very susceptible to fraud. When you get to that point and mom and dad have a checkbook, you know, you know, how many stories have you heard of the, oh, the, yeah. the scamster calling in? Um, you know, I, I know my grandfather, uh, you know, God rest his soul now, um, was gosh, I want to say I was back in Ohio, maybe about five years ago. And they called him and said, Hey, Greg killed a guy. Uh, in a car accident and he's in jail and he needs you to bring $10,000. Mm -hmm. And m luckily my cousin, Tommy went by the house and he saw grandpa with a wad of cash in his <sighs> upper pocket, pocket fixing the mower at like 85, of course. Yeah. And he looked at me and goes, grandpa, what's up with that money? He goes, ah, Greg killed a guy. I got to go <laughs> down. The I mean, that's just how my grandpa McDonald was. <laughs> God rest his soul. But he was going to literally go give this guy 10 grand. Oh. And it's just a perfect example of, you know, they're from an age where people would never do that. You know, you'd never take advantage. And I think that's another reason you need to control the checkbook. You need to make sure that you're, you're obviously on top of those things. And a lot of our listeners have those older parents right now. You know, my, going through some of 